The first panel today will be on getting our health priorities in order. My name is Ed Greising. I'm the executive director of the Lyndon Stewart Resnick Center for Public Health. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do today is we're going to try and get through this quickly on the intro. So their bios for the panelists and the moderator are in your book, so please take a chance to, to review those. Also, uh, there will be a, a possible opportunity for Q&A, but we can't guarantee that. depends on the flow of the, of, the, of the conversation up here. So welcome, everybody. Have a great meeting. Hope you learn a lot and uh, have a, a terrific conference. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, good morning. Nice to see you all. I'm Katie Couric, uh, I'm a journalist and I've also been very involved in the fight uh, against cancer and an advocate in healthcare. I'm a founder of Stand Up to Cancer, which has become a significant force in cancer research. And I'd like to give the Milken Institute a huge thank you for giving us the opportunity to really dive into this huge and hugely important topic, getting our healthcare priorities in order, prevention, research, and treatment. Uh, these are certainly the three biggest buckets in healthcare, so let me introduce the panel. We have Dr. Linda Freed from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Dr. Freed is a pioneer in gerontology and expert on how society can better support healthy aging, an important topic to all of us baby boomers. Also, uh, Mark Alice, who is the CEO of Celgene, a biopharmaceutical company focused on important therapies for cancers of the breast, lung, and pancreas, multiple myeloma and other blood type cancers, and immune inflammatory diseases. Tom Beauregard is an executive vice president and chief innovation officer of United Health Group, which ensures over 80 million people. And Tom has a big goal, come up with new initiatives that reimagine the way healthcare is delivered and Eric Lefkowski is co-founder and CEO of a company called Tempest. He's the leading, he is a leading tech entrepreneur, having co-founded Groupon and several other companies. He's got a very personal reason for moving into the healthcare space. And finally, Jim Robinson is president of Astellas Americas, a division of the global pharmaceutical company. He's also on the board of directors of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. So thank you all so much for being here. Excited to talk to you. Dr. Freed, let me start with you. Uh, you have pointed out that 70% of our health is based on prevention, uh, behavior, environment, social factors, <clears throat> but this country only spends 5% mm -hmm. of our healthcare dollars on public health and public health initiatives. So why the disconnect in your view? Well, it's a critical question, Katie, which we have to figure out the answer to, but I think we, so I'm a physician. I spent a lot of time in clinical practice and running health systems. I believe in clinical care, but we get captured very much by the urgent needs of people who are ill. And I think it's less obvious as a society how profoundly important it is to invest in helping people not get ill in the first place. But it's harder to, it's, it's um, an investment which we all benefit from. In fact, the United States, as its history of the last 100 years, is the result of those successful investments in our collective health. Uh, but it's a public good which requires us all believing in it and working together. It's very hard although now it's being done, to capture the return on investment from prevention, which is very high and highly cost effective, but, no, but very hard to capture short-term gains in terms of profit or return on investment. But there have been some positive things. For example, the anti-smoking in initiative has been Absolutely. hugely important and critical. There are many things. I mean, we actually count on them every single day. Uh, even being in Los Angeles, I, if you look, if you see a blue sky, it's a result of a huge amount of effort, and air pollution is the fourth leading cause of death in the world. There are many cities in the world you go to and you know why, uh, and you see lines of children around pediatric hospitals with very bad asthma every morning. But um, those investments in the air we breathe, the water we drink, 
how the conditions that enable people to stay active and have healthy food are part of public health, and there are collective investments that we can only do together, but they work. Tom, I know that your United Health Group has really put a great deal of emphasis on diabetes. Tell right. us why that has become sort of your pet project. Only because that if you look at it from a prevalence perspective, if you look at it from a cost perspective, and to Linda's point, uh, ROI perspective, whether you're a public payer or a private payer, I mean, it really is the area to focus on. And, and we've been, for about the last 10 years, focused upstream on uh, pre-diabetes and really the diabetes prevention program and trying to find ways to deliver that um, effectively, get people to enroll in it, stay with it, and, and ultimately scale it. Um, and that's, that's been, a, you know, kind of a 10-year journey where, a, you know, a lot of learnings, um, but we're getting there. And you're doing, actually, through a very uh, unique method. You've got a reality show. Yeah. Uh, and so you're, yeah. you're trying to reach the public in, a, in new yeah. sort of innovative ways. Yeah, and I, I think um, consumer engagement in prevention is everything, right? And so what we've learned as a large payer is you know a number of things through this journey, but one is you don't want to tag people as pre-diabetic. Um, so we've we've gone from sort of a group model with the Y, where we were delivering the diabetes prevention program, um, but we couldn't scale that quickly enough. So we moved to um, a virtual model with a reality show, Project Not Me, which was really just a, a tremendous. We got the same clinical results. Um, it was much more effective from a cost perspective. The return on investment was identical to the group model. Um, in terms of reduction in conversion to diabetes. And now we've taken that even further and created a model called Real Appeal, which is even more entertaining, uh, completely virtual, and we offer that to all of our members. Why do you think it's been so, why was that so successful? And why did that break through in a way some other yeah. prevention programs haven't? So, so much of it was just how we engage consumers. Um, and we had a lot to learn as you know, a large insurance company and a healthcare delivery system. But so much of it was making it entertaining, making it easy, again, not tagging people with a uh, sort of a chronic condition. Um, and, and a big part of it now with Real Appeal is it's, it's a free weight loss program. Um, and that really is the way we position it. Um, and again, we're getting the same result that the original DPP trials get, which is 5% weight loss reduces the risk of conversion to full-blown diabetes by 50%. And, to Linda's point, that's, you know, that's where prevention, there's just a massive return there. Again, whether you're a public payer or a private payer, there's just a massive ROI um, for institutions. Meanwhile, Jim, I know that you're sort of the whole ethos or mantra of your company has been to know your customer, that you can't really implement prevention strategies until you really understand people's behaviors, yeah. their healthcare goals, what they care about. So how is that kind of permeated your, your company, and how are you able to really gauge that? Yeah, so we, def we started by defining the patient experience. We started to really understand from the very early point of their journey, where do we need to engage, where can we engage? So we started first with engaging with empathy. The next point, point for us was really how do we deliver? And the core of who we are as a company is a research and development driven company, which then we, that means we innovate or we invent, which is not easy to do, but we focus on that aspect of helping patients and lastly, it's about improving the healthcare outcome. And so we're very focused on the outcome as well. So for us, it was all about defining it first and along each step, make sure that we have thought through how we engage with empathy, how we deliver, and how we improve the healthcare outcome that we're looking to partner with our patients and our providers on. And, and Mark, what about you? I know there's something called interception, using drugs to attack cancer and other diseases uh, at their very earliest stages. How involved argue in that, and how much for both of you do you really care about prevention? Because if you prevent diseases, you sell a lot fewer drugs. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and to my colleague's point already, just thinking about obesity as a, as a condition, uh, in the current statistics, about $300 billion a year of healthcare spend is on something related to obesity. So we think about that number, and then layer in the cost of pharmaceuticals for the treatment of all diseases combined, it's the same number. So obesity and the things we're talking about as a prevention strategy 
is a, is a crisis that the country needs to deal with. Because it not only increases your chances of, di obviously, having diabetes, but all kinds of diseases, heart disease, cancer, 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 yep. cancer. et cetera. Orthopedic, yes. Right, so I wanted to kind of bring it back to your question to me, Katie. Translational medicine and the public-private partnership with the NIH is fundamental to all of the discoveries that we've been realizing as an industry for the past 20 to 30 years in particular. And you mentioned immunotherapy. We're now able to look at cancer and the treatment of cancer on the prevention side, as you well know through your own advocacy, screening has had an enormous impact on breast cancer mortality and morbidity, on colorectal cancer. If it's caught early, patients are cured. If it's not, they'll die from metastatic disease. These are binary differences on the back of screening. And so clearly the cost-effective approach is to do basic research that drives us to learning how to, on a biomarker basis, identify patients not by the tissue. Prostate cancer is a, is a tissue. Lung cancer is a tissue. But now, this year already, FDA has approved a drug from one of my peer companies for a subset of lung cancer that has a mutation. Uh, the abbreviation is ALK positive. Well, those patients should only be treated with lung cancer with the medicines that target that driver mutation. The more we do that, the more effective therapy is and the, the lower cost will become. But what about interception, about finding it very, in the very early stages? Because as we, we all know that you have a much better chance of managing cancer or even curing it, and a number of other diseases, not just cancer, if it's detected early. So where does that fit in sort of your goals as a company? I, I, it's very high on our list. So you're thinking about the intersection and interception of through big data, through real world evidence, the idea of how to think about cancer in early stages. There is a question, though, from a national willpower point of view. Um, take prostate cancer screening. There are differences in how we think about how frequent someone should get screened. In breast cancer now, there's been huge controversy about how often should a woman have a, a mammogram. Um, in that context, I think we are confusing a lot of things right now. Screening, looking for biomarkers, and then, for example, as you know, Angelina Jolie has the so-called BRCA mutation and now that disease, I think appropriately, has been named for her in that that mutation is hereditary. Uh, a, a mother who has breast cancer that's BRCA positive or ovarian positive, their children have a, a, a multiplier likelihood of having that disease. Uh, some friends of mine are building a foundation right now uh, so that children can be, get screened in their teenage years with that mutation from a hereditary point of view, from a family point of view, and decide what to do with chemo prevention. That is, start some therapy before the disease actually presents itself. The challenge, of course, is that's a 10, 15 year study. Right. And how do you get people to participate? So I'll come back to what I said at the beginning and turn it back to you. The way to get our priorities straight is to take the major disease categories and figure out better ways of preventing them and treating them. Let's start with obesity, but when you look at aging, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases, we have to get smarter and better at how we diagnose and treat early. In fact, Eric, you know, I, 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 I'm gonna ask you about technology and the role it could play in prevention, because I know <clears throat> that's, that's really what you're focused on, but, but tell us what led you into the healthcare space. It was because your wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and sort of what you observed that made you say, there's gotta be a better way. Yeah, I mean, the, the experience was, was um, maddening in that, <clears throat> you know, we were, I, we had a series of technology companies um, all, all based in Chicago, and I would say to people, we were giving, uh, one of them is in the transportation space, and I would say, we were giving truck drivers picking up pallets of water bottles, um, more technology than we were giving oncologists who were treating patients. Um, and it's, it's um, if, you, if you look at it, you know, cancer, that remains a, a, a data problem today. There are roughly 1.7 million people that get diagnosed each year in North America, and yet the largest database of molecular data, which is called the Cancer Genome Atlas, has under 20,000 know, exomes or genomes of data. So it's really, really tiny. If you look at that in any of the major subtypes that cause high mortality rates, like pancreatic cancer, it's maybe 150 patients. If you pick any two common mutations, we were talking a minute ago about these targeted genes or targeted mutations 
that are leading to disease, if you pick any two combinations in pancreatic cancer, the largest data set you have is four, N of four, meaning I could look at four patients and try to find a pattern. Um, it's impossible, you can't find a pattern with those kind of small data sets. And so the journey for me was really, how do we bring technology to both clinical care and research? How do you build big data sets that people can actually look at in real time and navigate? And the challenge in the data sets that were being built is they were largely unidimensional. You had people building clinical data sets, you had people messing around with molecular data sets. People weren't trying to combine them both. And it's only when you combine them both, when you start to look at who is my patient from a phenotypic you know, perspective, who are they, do they have, are they a smoker, are they you know, premenopausal, who are they, what drugs are they taking, and what's their molecular composition. When you put all that together in mass, in very large quantities, you can begin to see patterns that historically were invisible. And those patterns are relevant for a treating physician, and they're relevant for research. And until we fix that fundamental problem, like basically build the infrastructure to collect data, I say to people all the time, it's akin to sending a great fisherman to the Atlantic Ocean with a very small fishing pole saying, let me know how many fish you catch. You might catch a fish, but you'll have an enormous amount of waste. Just to follow that point, this is the, 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 the miracle generation of biomedical research because of technology. As an enabler, so this, this uh, technology opportunity is that these patterns can be uh, constructed, the algorithms can be written. These data sets, as, as you point out, that are in silos, they're beginning to come into uh, 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 integrated data sets to allow for technology to enable the pattern generation and the understanding. People should understand that we're living in a period where the acceleration of how to do this and then figure out better ways to intervene is an unprecedented window of time. So technology and scientists that l like are at this table um, are literally have tools that they have never had before in medical history. Yeah. So our opportunity to invest in these things to work together across an ecosystem on the prevention side and the treatment side using technology as an enabler, this has never happened before in human history. So data is critically important, and I want to talk about that in a moment, and how we collect it and how we do a better job at it. But why haven't we seen more technology in terms of early detection of disease? You know, I know I got a virtual colonoscopy after getting a regular colonoscopy because I test all kinds of colonoscopies. But, you know, why hasn't there been more? Because, you know, again, if we, we really can nip a cancer in the bud or a lot of other diseases if we detect it earlier. Why, Eric, haven't we seen technology play a bit bigger role in, in uh, screening, detection, blood tests, all, all kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just, the, the inherent challenge from a technological perspective is that the systems that physicians rely on, and I can only speak about cancer, I can't speak to any other of the disease types, but in cancer, the systems people rely on are older systems, they're not bad systems, but they were constructed 20, 30 years ago in terms of their core code base, and they're basically in silos. So in pathology, the systems you use might be different than your electronic health uh, medical record system. And all, the, all these technologies are basically siloed, which means the process for a physician to basically treat a patient and analyze a particular medical condition is highly manual. We're at this unique moment in time where you have all these weird and massive technology paradigm shifts occurring at one time. You basically have genomic data that can now be collected at a fraction of the cost historically. It's a million-fold reduction in the cost of sequencing a patient over 12 years. So 12 years ago, what cost a million dollars, today cost a dollar. At the same time, you have all this really amazing imagery technology that's coming where you'll be able to look at scans and slides and look at anatomical data and basically map it. And when the cost of imaging comes down, when the cost of generating genomic data comes down, you, begin to, you can begin to imagine a, a technology platform that physicians can rely on in an inexpensive and affordable way to basically manage the early side of these diseases. If not, you're at, somebody has to pay that bill. And the yeah. inherent problem is the system is just not set up do, you know, you, as it is, you know, you go to any NCI cancer center and we work with dozens, these oncologists are seeing 40 patients a day they, they can't handle another 40 or another 40, and they can't be asked to do three times as much with no tools. And so, uh, you know, if, if we go in any other industry, 
all right, pick any other industry, technology, other than um, uh, arguably government, technology has fundamentally changed how that industry performs. How will it change on the insurance industry? All these technological advancements in terms of detection treatment. I mean, if it's evidence-based, then sort of the short story is we'll reimburse it. Um, because a lot of these tests are very expensive. They are. But again, to the extent that there's evidence, then you know, we reimburse. Um, and, and we do our own sort of real-world studies using our data. So we've actually got you know, a platform that we call Phase 5 with Northwestern, where whether it's a new technology, a new device, a new drug, we actually study kind of real-world outcomes, not for reimbursement purposes, but really just to understand um, from a patient perspective um, to, to kind of really track FDA-approved devices and drugs. Katie, if I can add something else, I, I think that this moment of technological disruption has huge power if we could develop platforms where we could layer the, the individual screening, the community screening and hotspotting, and population-wide screening, um, that there are layers of understanding the opportunities for prevention if they're integrated, where, where we could really build, a, I think, a completely unprecedented approach to the perhaps the complement of precision medicine, which would be precision prevention, um, where we can understand the different layers of risk that people experience and where they, you know, the individual clinician or the public health system could really draw on that to do the kind of screening for the people who need it that you were suggesting. Yeah. There's, a, there's a regulatory framework here as well, Katie, so we, we've just said it. In the regulatory framework where we use interventions and decide on how to treat, uh, there's sort of a, a, a framework that has to be followed. So disruption has to be in, in kind of an open market way available. Today, it's so fragmented and segmented, and mm -hmm. we have to follow the process for getting new devices, new medicines approved using somewhat and at times antiquated views of, of drug development, of homogeneity of patient populations. So the regulatory framework has to really get caught up with the technolo technology framework. If that doesn't happen, the adoption curve, even in the, in the world that was described by the payers, where you have outcomes and evidence that might make a difference, uh, we're still dealing with the regulatory framework that doesn't allow that interchangeability, the use of uh, less or more data, and certainly the adoption of technology. That has to be correlated mm -hmm. under the regulatory framework with lots of outcomes-based research that today we'd like to do, but we're not asked to do it. And then in a post-marketing setting, it doesn't actually add enough value sometimes to the whole equation. So the regulatory framework is really important to understand in this context. And Jim, what do you think? Do you think it's changing for the better? Uh, do you think that the FDA will, will be faster in terms of approving drugs and helping integrate all these different things? Well, I think it starts first with the, the, the take it a step back to, with the company, right? So for us, the promise of real world evidence, I think it's twofold. It's simulation, being able to simulate what you would potentially see in a clinical development program to really be able to enhance how you're going to go about doing clinical development as opposed to potentially an old method. So even looking internally first, is there something we can do to on, kind of unleash or tap into real world, uh, real world evidence to be able to do that for us. So we actually put the best clinical development program together from the very beginning. We take a lot of the guesswork out and we understand really upfront which patients are specifically going to benefit from the products that's being developed. That starts internally with us first. And then to build on the point on the regulatory framework, it, it's not there yet. And I think that it will get there. I think the FDA has moved mountains to be able to bring new innovations to market, especially we can talk about in the cancer space. So the work that's been done there has been remarkable. So great leadership in the FDA in that space, great work, and I, I think there, it will come. And as these silos come down, and when there's more sharing of information, and when there's a clearer sense of the predictive value, and the evidence of the real world evidence being proven, then you'll see a regulatory framework that will follow. Linda, I want to step out of the cancer world for a moment and ask you about your research, which is so interesting. You're sort of renowned for your research on frailty. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me what kind of research you're conducting, what you're learning, and why this is a, an a area that's so important, especially for an aging population. So I, I started out as a young geriatrician being told that 
you know when someone's frail by looking at them. But I found over a period of years that I knew, but what I knew differed very much from what other people would, would have called. So that began a many year journey to be able to understand if this was meaningful and, uh, if you, and, and what was going on. And if you fast forward, what, you, what I can now say, um, what now feels like 300 years later, uh, <laughs> that, that frailty is actually a medical syndrome uh, that is in its later stages recognizable, just as you can recognize if uh, looking at somebody, if they have bad lung disease, because they're not breathing very well. Um, you can diagnose frailty now by its phenotype uh, the, uh, in the later stages, but what's going on is actually an inherent aging-related process, which up to a certain point is modifiable. So from a prevention point of view, um, it looks like prevention works, and what's going on is not a single organ disease. It's, a, um, it's essentially the unraveling of the multi-system uh, physiologic regulation that makes us resilient human beings. Uh, able to bounce back after an illness and able to regulate all our very finely tuned systems together. And when that mutual regulation that keeps us from uh, falling apart in the face of extremes of heat or cold that enables us to bounce back after an illness, when that wears down, it gets past a threshold where things really sink. So we now know, biologically, what is going on to a good degree, not, not totally. Um, it is prob probably has deep basic biological origins, uh, and we have some hints about what those might be. And it is very clear that there are some very basic mon apple pie approaches that are really good for prevention, like staying physically active until you're 120. So. <laughs> Anything else other than staying physically active? I'm sure there are plenty of people in this audience and maybe even on this panel who'd be interested in hearing <laughs> what else should be done to yeah. increase longevity. Yeah. So there are several issues there. One is increasing longevity itself. The other issue is staying robust and healthy through, through those longer lives, and both are goals. I have to say the U.S. and the West and Japan over the last hundred years have done an astounding job of increasing longevity because we've made very intentional and wise investments in health at every age and stage of life, which um, sometimes we don't remember that we've added 30 years to human life expectancy, 35 even, in the last hundred years. That's an unprecedented historic feat. Tom, you know, I think insurance companies sometimes get a bad rap, but you all are very involved in research yourselves, uh, yes. particularly as uh, President Trump wants to decrease funding for the NIH. I think it just actually increased, uh, I think just even last night, but th looking forward, he wants to decrease it next year. And also academic institutions, sometimes there's less funding even there. So what role have insurance companies, in particular, your particularly yours, played in funding medical research? Yeah, I would say that, and it gets back to the comments I made about you know, searching for evidence. Um, and and it, you know, for better clinical outcomes, for a better return, um, we invest quite a bit, and not sort of in a traditional academic way, um, in randomized control studies and pilots um, um, every year focused on sort of areas from a health economics and a health outcome standpoint where we see issues. So I'll give you... A, a very specific example, you know, outside the diabetes space, our highest um, cost in uh, the Medicaid low-income populations, where the largest payer in that space, is um, NICU, preterm babies. That, um, and so we have been sort of looking at different models, and there's a, a model called group prenatal care um, that's been around for about 25 years that has never scaled. And this is a model that basically brings moms together um, who have common due dates, um, and they go through basically prenatal care together. And it's, you know, they get the clinical care that's required, but then they also get social support and coaching. And um, the data on this is there's a 50% um, 
reduction in rapid repeat pregnancies, and more importantly, a 30% reduction in preterm births. So much healthier babies, much lower cost. Um, so we've invested in trial work in this area just to verify it. We created a program that we put out in the public domain um, called Expect With Me, and now we're working with the March of Dimes as the sort of most credible not-for-profit entity in the um, healthy babies space to try to scale that nationally. So it's just an example. Um, really important clinical outcomes, healthier babies, um, but it's, for us, that research leads to what reimbursement and what we're good at is scale. We can move things you know, through our markets quickly and extend them to other payers as well. Jim, what are you most excited about drug development? When you look at sort of the landscape and you see new and novel approaches uh, coming through the pipeline, uh, help us understand sort of how that's changed and what you're excited about. So I think we're at an inflection point. We had a, a couple comments earlier already in the panel. We're at a point where the science is rapidly catching up with the promise. And when we look at rare diseases, as an example, or even in, in some cases oncology, we're now looking at, at treating cancers right now almost in a chronic fashion until the cure can come. Where in the past, we didn't have that option. And I think that's proven out now time and time again in terms of the fact that you're seeing this latest innovation in, in cancer care really addressing for the first time an unmet medical need. And you're even seeing it in some very rare diseases as well. So there's a heavy emphasis in terms of the, in, the investment being made across the ecosphere. So when you think about the NIH, there's such a critical point and such a critical partner of what happens in basic research as our academic institutions, as our the biopharmaceutical uh, industry in terms of that support. So all of that working together, I'm excited about the fact that there's a recognition that it takes everyone focused in a particular uh, fashion or area to be able to bring about this innovation. So I do think there's that collaboration that's taking place, which is exciting. I think we're seeing the innovation come to market now, which is very exciting. And I think we have more opportunity to really um, build on what we were seeing right now. And what about you, Mark? I mean, I know immunotherapy is an area that we're really excited about. I think 70% of stand-up to cancer research dollars goes to immunotherapeutic approaches. Mm -hmm. I know you're excited about that, but you're also doing some other interesting things at Selvine. Absolutely. So I, I completely agree with what was said already. This is just an incredible time. For us, uh, thank you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> She's fixing my earpiece, if you didn't notice, thank you. <laughs> moderator I'm not, duties, I'm not just moderator duties include fixing the earpiece, so thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, the recognition that the immune system can be altered in the setting of cancer or other diseases is something of Star Wars medicine, and we're there. Um, big data is going to help us, but this idea that we can, for example, in the case of certain cancers, uh, literally, uh, through a process called apheresis, take cells from a patient, modify those cells externally to then activate the person's immune system by just reinfusing these engineered cells that come from the patient and then literally seeing them be cured with diseases like lymphoma. Um, you know, where is that going to go? We've now, uh, through genetic scissors, been able to edit genes for, for example, hemophilia. So this learning is accelerating and building on itself across disease spectrums, but recognizing that if we have strong immune systems in the frailty setting, in other settings, if we're able to use and interact with our own immune system, the prospect for human health is staggeringly good. And that's where we're at right now. That's the most exciting part of medicine across the board. In cancer, the issue has been solid tumors are invisible to your immune system. So the checkpoint inhibitors, the immunotherapeutic agents that the world is so excited about, uh, it's a simple notion. There is a way to create recognizability for lung cancer, head and neck cancer. And the story that I, I tell, and you, you and I saw each other the other night, Jimmy Carter, our former president, had metastatic, metastatic melanoma uh, when these drugs were starting to come out. His life expectancy, because of his age, but also because of the disease that had metastasized to his brain, was less than six months. That was five years ago. He got on a clinical trial of one of these checkpoint inhibitors, and his uh, disease has been in remission 
brain metastases uh, for these five years. Uh, Georgia passed a law to make sure that in Georgia, it's the Jimmy Carter law, every citizen of the state would have access to these drugs on the back of President Carter's response. So it's very exciting, but the, the notion that science and our ability to manipulate and make the immune system act a certain way on behalf of an individual patient and to get an individual response, uh, how could we not be more excited about that? What do you think about that, Eric, about sort of this promise of immunotherapy? I mean, some people say it's been <clears throat> overhyped. There was a piece in USA Today, I think Otis Brawley, Brawley the uh, head of the American Cancer Society, said we're starting to believe our own bullshit, basically, uh, <laughs> as was his quote, <laughs> and talking about people spending their life savings on therapies that are kind of over-promising and under-delivering. So how do you look at immunotherapy and, and, and how data can, can bolster sort of the effic efficacy of immunotherapy? I mean, so the, the first, I think, answer is, is um, doesn't tell you much, is that both are totally, both perspectives are totally true. So um, roughly 25 years ago, 510,000 people died a year in North America of cancer. It's about 600,000 last year. So with all the amazing progress we've made, mortality rates, especially for late stage disease, metastatic disease, or certain you know, just tricky types like liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, are almost untouched in the past quarter century. So um, that said, um, what we have seen recently with targeted oncotherapies, um, we mentioned one a minute ago with alk mutation, um, with immunotherapy are nothing short of amazing. I mean, we, um, we do some, um, some of the uh, molecular analysis for a project at Duke, which got a bunch of attention because on 60 Minutes, it's basically analyzing GBMs and um, immunotherapy. And you, you see certain patients that, exactly like Jimmy Carter, should have not made it that are alive and completely cancer-free. So we, we're starting to understand, I think, how you would actually bring precision medicine to the world of cancer. The inherent problem we're all facing, and it will get more frustrating before it gets less frustrating, is that we again have an infrastructure that doesn't honor technology, that doesn't honor data. And so you're about to now have incredible you know, neoantigen peptides and vaccines and CRISPR technology and targeted oncotherapies and on and on and on, but trying to figure out who we should administer them to is gonna be this broken, kind of step in the, in, the, in the chain. And that's what we have to fix first. It's, it's very similar, by the way, to like, if you think about when everyone on this panel grew up in a world where there were three television stations and then, you know, somebody was laying um, cable one day in your house and next thing you know, you turn around 25 years later and there's 500 TV stations. And that entire revolution in content was brought out by a technological, you know, kind of a platform that got built. And if we don't build that in cancer, you're gonna see an incredible disparity. The, the first wave of that disparity is going to be that the top NCI cancer centers, the academic institutions that can afford to kind of tackle that, are gonna begin dispensing a quality of care that is demonstrably different than other places. And the system's not set up for that either. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, you know, I say to people, and I'm, I've now been to 60 NCI cancer centers in the last year, and I say to every one of them, you know, it's time to clean your room. Um, you know, we've gotten this far, but now it's like, and there's nothing exciting about cleaning up data and structuring it, putting it in one place. It's like- So where are we? Place. Where are we in that? I mean, uh, in terms of data collection and, you know, having, having the information we need to make these decisions for individual patients. So, um, I mean, where are we? We're, you know, it's day one. The, the, the challenge is for this, to, for this data to be really useful, and, and, it's, and I have a doctor next to me, so it, the, it's a super complicated technological challenge. I mean, basically for the last hundred years, physicians could do their jobs and they didn't really need technology. Right? A surgeon could be a surgeon, he didn't need zeros and ones. This is really the first moment, it's starting in oncology, I think it'll permeate into other areas, but it's starting in oncology where for the first time ever, you have a large cohort of physicians saying, I can't do my job. I can't, every paper that's published, every trial that's running is tied to a molecule. And all of a sudden, you're asking me to treat 40 patients a day and what? Read an infinite amount of data and process understanding and go back and take a biology class because part of the stuff I don't even, I haven't touched it in 25 years. So they need technology. And, and so this is the moment. You, you, for the first time ever, have people saying, okay, 
I'll let you in, help me build systems together. And I think that's the first step. We can get that done and, and, and actually provide real technology that allows clinicians to analyze clinical data and molecular data in real time, and then connect that to insurance, connect that to pharma, connect that to all the other aspects. You'll, you'll have at least a proof point where technology plus physician equals a better outcome for patients. And you're seeing that happen with something called convergence. I know at, at Stand Up to Cancer, we have experts in engineering, math, computer science, physicists, all kind of coming together to, to attack this problem from multiple standpoints. Are you all seeing convergence in the work that you're doing? And what kind of impact is it having? Jim? I think I'll just build on what Eric just said. I think we're still on day one. I look at it from a standpoint of much of the data that I see that we evaluate and that is collected is after the fact. It's after because healthcare is still episodic. So you're collecting it once the patient's been seen, not before, you know, obviously they've had an issue arise. And then if it's being captured after the fact, it's generally housed in either electronic medical record or some other repository that is siloed off within the institution that it was actually um, the patient was in, and then it goes to the insurance provider, et cetera. So then you're, you're constantly trying to figure out how to trace that data to be able to really do an evaluation that can lead to an insight that actually can help you make a better decision in the future. So it can't be said enough. The best way to approach this is we've got to come up with a uniform platform that the data can be housed in, can be easily manipulated, evaluated, and insight can be gained. There are just too many stakeholders holding on to bits and pieces of the data that will absent a clear line of sight from A to Z on that data. We're never gonna be able to get to nirvana, which is what we would say day 365. Linda, what about you? Are you seeing a lot of convergence in your work? Oh, absolutely. So uh, there's so many ways. Even the science that I've done, you know, I've done at a point of convergence. So it's quantitative dynamical systems modeling with physicists and engineers and biologists and geriatricians in population health science looking at thousands of people. Um, I couldn't have told you anything I told you before without having engaged in that kind of thinking. But um, so many of our abilities to take the, that kind of science and translate it into things that matter um, for health and, and better treatment are going to require these kinds of convergences of completely new kinds of teams working together with, mutual, with an ability to mutually hear and understand what everybody brings to the table. And that's a whole new way to build both a health system and delivery, as well as to do the basic science. It sounds expensive, though. I mean, how is this reflected in drug prices? And maybe you can explain, Mark, how why drugs or you know uh, treatments for disease are so expensive. Sure, we, we've heard some of the the reasons, sort of the fragmented approach to it, but. Just to put some context around cost first and then value, <clears throat> the, the, the typical pharmaceutical that's developed today uh, will cost anywhere between one and two billion dollars of investment to be able to get that one innovative molecule. Um, this is literature based, this is, this is research based, so it's not Mark on behalf of Celgene or, or Jim and Estellas. This, this is third party information that puts it out there. Um, each of the studies that we do, randomized studies that we do for our cancer medicines, and increasingly for uh, non-cancer medicines, require a database that the study cost is at least $100 million. So it's very, very difficult to do a pivotal registration study without spending around $100 million on average. That's all at risk, because if the molecule fails, that investment is gone, and hopefully we will learn from, from it, but in the end, the molecule fails. So that uh, cost to get to market is something that I think stakeholders recognize and understand quite well. I think Dr. Brawley's comment about cancer patients uh, perhaps going bankrupt on the back of their treatment is an important point, and it was already said. There is an element of truth to that. The same way there's an element of truth about innovation and what it costs and incentives to bring new medicines to the market. I think where this comes together is technology. So if we were to be able to better treat homogeneous groups of patients with cancer, 
knowing that the outcomes were better, everyone would pay more for that. The issue is that we're treating more broadly patient pools where only about half of the patients in any one given pool with cancer will truly derive benefit. But we treat everyone to figure out where that benefit comes from. So we have to, in some way, come up with a way to reward innovation, and that is the cost of launching a product, putting a product into the market. Um, the, the debate about price increases is interesting to me, um, but I think it's kind of misplaced. I started with the, the notion that obesity costs $300 billion a year out of a $3 trillion U.S. healthcare spend. That's the same amount as all the pharmaceutical products for all diseases in a year. And if you look at the cancer space, it has been the same amount, roughly, of that spend for the past 30 years, despite the fact that we have new miraculous drugs. The last comment I'll make about access and affordability is we would, and you know, we have the insurance industry here, so I'd, I'd be interested in the perspective, we would never ask a patient to pay out of pocket a, a copay or a coinsurance of 50% of the cost of a life-saving surgical procedure. So a heart transplant, a liver transplant, some intervention that would deal with uh, uh, disease, including surgical resections of, of tumors. Um, patients don't see that cost, but we have no problem with a copay scheme for patients with cancer where up to 50% of a life-saving drug is out of pocket. So it's, it's really a misaligned view of how interventions are cost-effective or not, and then how the access schemes are created that actually make it more expensive or less expensive for patients. We'd love to work across the system for value-based, outcomes-based pricing, uh, but the system isn't set up for that. Tom? Well, and that, and that does get to sort of that need for real-world, you know, sort of phase five post-FDA approval research. We need to know for those 50% of patients, you know, you, you really do want to be able to say it works or it doesn't work, um, which, you know, trials don't necessarily define, right? I mean, trials are kind of set up with perfect people. Um, and, you know, they, well, we, we should argue this point because yeah. <laughs> the trials are, are set up with a regulatory framework where absolutely they represent the pool of patients now from a, 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 a recruitment point of view. Right. There's no question, for example, in prostate cancer, I still don't know why, maybe, maybe Jim can speak to it, why African Americans have an epidemiological much higher rate of prostate cancer, but in the studies we do, they're underrepresented. Yeah. In cardiology trials, women have an equal risk as men, yet in trials, women are underrepresented. So there's a demographic sort of mm -hmm. uh, component to this. But the studies do represent the disease. There's no question. Right. But if you look at the, if you look without, at the populations, I mean, right. that really is. And, and so that's really what we're trying to do is to say once it's through the process, once we're reimbursing, and, and it's not just because of the economic consequences. It's because you don't want to put people through this, right? right? So whatever their out of pocket is, whatever their copays are, you know, ultimately it's it's twofold. You really do want to get the right treatment and. And that's where I think one of the things that we're doing um, much more readily now is contributing our data, combining it with clinical data um, to, to get to those you know, sort of more refined um, decisions, not payment decisions, but treatment decisions. The other aspect of cost that we should put on the table, and again, Jim might want to comment on this, but I think it's the technology side as well. We have a lifetime price cap. It's called patent expiry. So 90% of prescriptions today in the United States are generics. If we create more competition in the generic field, and some of the outlier uh, examples that we've heard of in the last year, year and a half, are situations where in the generic market, there was only one version of a drug available, and certain companies made what now is widely recognized as bad judgment to raise that price dramatically in the face of no competition. So as we increase competition, as we think about patent term expiry, there is a lifetime cost to the product, but then society benefits at 90% less price over time. And you know that in the cancer space. Most cancer drugs today that treat disease are generics. In fact, the vast majority of the units of drug to treat cancer across the board are generics. 
To quote President Trump, health care is really complicated. <laughs> uh, Linda, Linda tell, tell us about your concerns about access, because obviously in your mm -hmm. role as a public health expert, you care deeply about mm -hmm. you know, the availability for some people to afford these drugs and others not. I, I think I read well, a, a, a quote from you that people who have access to this kind of quality health care or, you know, treatment, whatever, they have a, a, a nine, they, they have a life expectancy of more, of nine years over yeah. those who don't. So I, I think we need to um, think in new ways at every level, actually. We have amazing breakthroughs in terms of the ability to cure. I mean, unprecedented, but we have to reorganize for that. Uh, we have to think differently about the investments. Um, we might want to say, well, if these chances for cure are quite costly, we need to allocate the, the responsibility differently, but we might also need to make sure that people aren't getting these diseases if they don't have to. Um, because, in fact, it turns out that's really cost-effective. and. And, f and the U.S.'s economy is, is hugely, over the last 70 years, built on our wise investments in science and the economic benefits of people being healthy, as well as the economic benefits of the science itself. So part of the challenge is how we make sure that people who don't have access to health, as well as medical care, are getting both, so that we can rebalance the ability to afford the more expensive things for the people who need it. And we have, as a society, have not m figured out that that is perhaps one of the solutions I think we need to employ. We've been, just to go to the e natural experiment we've been conducting in the US, which you just alluded to, we have an astounding evidence now, astounding, that people who are socioeconomically better off and have ac had access to prevention and health promotion appropriately th at every age and stage of life are getting much less dementia, much less Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease rates are 75% lower at every age than they were 50 years ago. Um, but people who do not have access to that opportunity for health at every age and stage of life are doing poorly. In fact, they're doing worse than they used to. And as a consequence of that, the US health status has actually, in the last 20 years, as a population, sunk to the bottom of our peer nations. So how we, um, that's not my data, that's US uh, and uh, Institute of Medicine and National Research Council data. But, uh, so how we make wise investments for whole of society is going to be critical. Going back to the obesity example, if we, that's going to require shifts in, in even the way we live, because in fact, prevention's the only solution, but we all have to do it together. Don't you see that happening a little bit in terms of obesity, uh, in terms of food companies trying to, if you look right. at what Pepsi's trying to do, I, yes. I don't know if you can be, you could be cynical about that, but it seems to me that finally the obesity epidemic and childhood obesity, type two diabetes mm -hmm. among a younger population is starting to be taken a lot more seriously. So I think your point is critical, that this is an all of society investment that we have to make. Every sector has a role to play. In the example of obesity, prediabetes, right. um, these are huge drivers of future poor health and for for a huge proportion of our population. Now, there's a few cities in which we see the rates of childhood obesity declining, but not a lot yet. And so, while I think every sector is wisely and and conscientiously trying to interrogate how they shift their product offerings, how they even market them, um, how we redesign our cities to, uh, and environments. We're not there yet, and we really need to invest in figuring out what the optimizing packages are so that our kids aren't growing up obese. And, and, and Eric, are you worried about accessibility because, you know, data, technology, that's usually 
for people who can afford it, right? So how do you ensure sort of this new paradigm for medical research, treatment, even prevention, that it crosses into all populations and not just the well-to-do? Yeah, I mean, I think it just, it just does. You know, if you look at any technology paradigm shift, and, and we've had big companies in, in several, the internet, mobile, social, you know, these things are like tsunamis, they're unavoidable. And they're, they're virtually never led by the government. They're almost entirely private in orientation. And when they show up, when somebody builds something better and it creates value, then you'll see physicians adopt it, you'll see patients demand it, and it will just roll out. The, 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 the bigger challenge, I think, that's been highlighted here is, you know, this, from a data perspective, the system is just so broken, right? You, you say healthcare is complicated. Anything's complicated with no data. And we make it as hard as you could possibly make it. So one of the things that we do are when we collect data from these big NCI cancer centers, we're focused on response and outcome data. It's very hard to get, but if you don't know what drug somebody took and how they responded, and you connect that to their molecular composition, you're just in the dark. And as we begin to amass that data, we think a lot about how are we gonna send that data to insurance? How are we gonna send that data to biotech and pharma? Because if you hold on to that data, everyone's trying to guess at what to do. The payers would much, would much rather, I'm sure, they'd like to pay as efficiently as they can. If something is going to reduce mortality rates and make people healthier, they wanna fund it. And likewise, the last thing a pharma company would want to do is invest $2 billion in a drug that isn't going to work. But we're all, we all live in this complete void of data. I mean, in cancer alone, and this is probably unique, there is an enormous number of people, but in academic institutions, it, some statistics say as high as 70% of people, that are treated with a combinatorial therapy, an off-label drug, or a dose, for which there's no NCECN guideline. Where's this data? I mean, if I were a pharma company, it's the first thing I'd want to know. How are people responding? We're, we're just constantly asking people to just shoot in the dark, and then we're getting mad at them when the outcome isn't what we want or it's too expensive. And it is the end product of a system that just found itself with no data. If you actually take the time to, to kind of get all the information in one place and then disseminate it to all the stakeholders, I think you'll see costs become much more rational, therapeutics become far more effective, and uh, just a different balanced system. And I think at this point, it's unavoidable. That world will show up. I just don't know if it's five years or 25 years, and I just don't know what companies like Tempest's role is gonna be in that world. Well, Jim and Mark, I mean, how can you? I think it's happening now. I mean, I, it's so uh, a couple of comments uh, to build on Mark's point, and I'll, I'll maybe a couple of themes. Access is everything when you look at it from a pharmaceutical company's perspective. A $2.2 billion investment over 12 years provides no one value if the patient can't access the medicine that it's been approved. The paradigm of, well, th these are pristine trials with pristine hand-picked patients to be able to maximize the outcome. I would challenge that paradigm as being dated, and especially when you're thinking about cancer. It's a pretty clear patient that you're looking to treat. This patient has a particular cancer, a tumor, whatever the case might be. It's hard to have this pristine patient type that you're after when you're looking at doing a study to measure overall survival or progression-free survival. The payer paradigm of, well, we need to look at it from a real-world evidence perspective post-approval is nothing more than it causes a delay. It delays the opportunity for that patient to access the medicine that they need to be able to get the outcome that potentially could keep them alive or treat their cancer uh, and put it into remission. So I think that paradigm's got to shift overall. And um, whether it's access to prevention, whether it's access to healthcare, the key theme like, that's coming up is it's overcomplicated. It's burdensome. So how do we move from an opaque system or just a scary system to a system that actually is simplified so that is putting the patient at the center of what we need to do, is what we should do, and making sure that we build the world of healthcare on the patient versus build it in silos based on, on, on the particular need of that entity. And if but we are you get getting the data you need, I guess, to Eric's point? Uh, it, why is there a disconnect between pharmaceutical companies and the patient outcomes that we're seeing? Because to serve the patient, you need to know patient outcomes writ large, right? I think there's an abundance of data that's available to demonstrate an outcomes uh, of the product that we're maybe, uh, a particular product 
in a real, real world, world setting, but it takes time, right? So, so much of what is done is, is the prospective randomized trials in the clinical development program. There's a tremendous amount of effort and work that goes into it to get to the product approved by the FDA. This real world outcomes measure takes time, and it, that time sometimes causes a delay. We advocate for it because we want to be able to also figure out if there are other patients that can benefit, and a specific type of patient, uh, patient would even see a higher benefit. But uh, without question, it's a balance. We've got to make sure that we get the CDP right up front and we look to the real world evidence after the fact. But it shouldn't be um, to cause a delay for access to the product. Mark? So, yeah, so and, and I would say there is no delay. It's so with FDA approval, we're reimbursing. So what we're really trying to do then is understand real world outcomes so we can help consumers and providers make right. better decisions. So I just want to be clear that FDA approval Reimbursement yeah, and, follows. And, and just pick up on a couple of points and, and try to put some context around it. So what you're hearing in this debate is that if we represent across the ecosystem of healthcare different stakeholders, put the patient at the center, let's say we spend a dollar to treat patient X with a cancer or any disease, but in cancer that's what we're talking about. 90 cents of that dollar is to deliver the 10 cents, which is the medicine. It's, it's a strange relationship where it takes 90 cents of a dollar to actually give a medicine to a patient to treat them. So we're spending much more on all of the systems, all the administration, all of what needs to happen to define how to treat the patient. So to Jim's point, if we could sort of reverse that and say, you know, what are the outlines, what are the guidelines? And I, and I will challenge a little bit of what I heard this way. Um, we know because we have six products in the market for uh, what now are a dozen or so cancers, some on label, some of course NCCN guideline listed. This is a, a compendia, clinical guidelines uh, program that is built around the cancer academic centers in the US. So it's quite reputable. Um, industry really does nothing to do that except these academics look at trials and say, what's the best way to treat patients with available therapy? Um, we, we know that the vast majority of patients, because we do mandatory pharmacovigilance on these products after they're in the market, we have to report to the FDA on side effects that happen in the market, et cetera. We know that the vast majority of the portfolio we have and we know across the industry, because the data are readily available, they are aligned and correlated with the exact data sets that support. The notion that a medical oncologist or hematologist in the United States today wouldn't somehow treat a patient without the insurance scheme behind it, without knowing exactly what the evidence would be that's available, that is available, peer-reviewed and otherwise, um, to put that patient at risk of not being able to be, afford it, they're out of pocket, whatever they're trying, it's, it is a false notion. Doctors do not do that, they will not do that. They know the cost emotionally and economically to every family, every patient with cancer, they're using the best data, largely supported by the insurance carrier, to say, here's the clinical pathway. Here's what we'll reimburse. The question now in ASCO, the big cancer organization, they are now suggesting that that rigorous view is actually creating a difference in how people are treated, and it's not a good difference. So the ASCO statement that's coming out now is, let's be really careful where we go, where the system is so rigid that certain subsets of patients who be treat, should be treated differently are not allowed to be treated differently. So back to affordability and access, we could have the pendulum go the whole other way, where everything is done on an algorithm, everything is done to treat a cancer patient on the back of some formula, not a doctor sitting across from a cancer patient saying, we think we should treat you this way. Back to frailty, an 80-year-old with myeloma who looks like a 60-year-old can get an autologous bone marrow transplant. A 60-year-old who looks like an 80-year-old with myeloma won't get a transplant because it might kill them. But how do we know that when we look at raw data and, and aggregate data? The physician still needs to be able to practice medicine. Mm -hmm. What do you think, so we only have a few minutes left, so uh, maybe you just go down the line and say what, since this is really about priorities, what needs to be done to improve the system and what are you most excited about that you see on the horizon yeah. in terms of really patient care? 
Jim, we'll start with you. Sure. So I, I, a lot of the themes today came through pretty loud and clear. This is a very exciting time. The, the science is catching up with the promise when you look at it from a uh, research and development perspective. But I also believe with the ability to have more data that actually can um, be an, on a shared platform that allows for more precise analytics and allows for better insight into decision making would really not only help you know, the biopharmaceutical industry, it helps patients in terms of empowering them to be able to make better decisions on their health care as well. It helps patients with prevention in terms of how they should better control how they're li living their life, especially if they're looking to prevent a, a condition that is wholly preventable, like in some cases we've talked about. So I look at it from what I'm excited about is, is the science. The science is catching up with the promise. We're seeing tremendous innovation in the marketplace. We'll have even smarter opportunities to, to bring that science to the right patients and empower patients to make the right decisions with their health. Eric, I just wanted to ask you, I know I want your perspective, but is data really a, you know, a panacea because data can only get you so far. I mean, cancer, I always say, is a thousand different diseases and thousands of different biologies, right? So it can narrow your treatment, your course of treatment and your options and your approaches, but it's not everything, is it? It really is. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, wish it, I wish it weren't. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the first step. I mean, it, the, the data in and of itself can't treat a patient, so you can't give somebody zeros and ones and say you're, you're cured. Um, you just use data to figure out what to do, and figuring out what to do is the, is the first step of precision medicine, and precision medicine is the only way we fight cancer. It's not 200 subtypes, it's 200,000 subtypes. It's multiple genetic combinations, both at a DNA level, at an RNA level, at a proteomic level, at an epigenetic level, at a microbiomic level, I mean, and understanding that and understanding that each patient is unique is the only way we make demonstrable progress in cancer, likely in diabetes, likely in neurological disorders, and so on and so forth. And you, you can't begin to unravel these algorithmic diseases without data. So the fact that we don't live in a world today that every insurance provider can look at every single drug everyone's been given over the last five years and how they responded is a tragedy. The fact that we ask biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies to go to basically go fishing and try to answer questions with very limited data sets is a tragedy. Um, and the fact that we ask doctors to make decisions when there's a fork in the road and there's often a fork in the road for 600,000 people that die a year of cancer is a tragedy when they have no data. So the very first step is that. If we get that right, at least we're on the road to all the amazing things that I think this panel concurs are going to be coming, most of which will be in the biologies and, and chemistries. But the very first step is who's, who am I dealing with and how are they similar to everybody who came before? And, and do you think the moonshot is going to have a big impact on data collection? You just rolled your eyes, I saw. Well, because I'm, I'm Chloe here who runs PR is like afraid of what I'm going to say, I'm sure, because I say things I shouldn't say in these contexts. So I will just say this. I, I don't, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge believer that these kind of innovations can be led by any governmental entity or any collaborative approach. I don't think committees, I don't think groups of people getting together solve these problems. I think your, our world, everybody in this panel's world has been completely turned upside down. We're probably staring at a screen all day long because of Apple and, and, and Google or Android, or Samsung, companies like that. That's where, the, that's where the amazing innovation comes from. And I, I think there are partnerships that need to take place between data scientists and technologists and um, physicians and and, and, and all throughout the, the, the spectrum. But I, I think pinning this on, we've got to get together and form a committee and agree on how we're going to solve this problem is what we've been doing for the last decade, and it just doesn't lead to the kind of progress we need to make. I'd like to appoint all of you to the committee. <laughs> Linda, what about you? So I, um, I, I completely think we're at a moment of many simultaneous breakthroughs. And part of the conversation is how to organize them so the whole's greater than the sum of the parts. And, and the point we're making, which is, I think, a really important time, is that we're coming together to understand that the goal of all of this is people's health. It's the health of the person. Um, it's that 
individually and as a society, we're doing better because we're healthy. And that actually is the way to organize this because you can use data to make decisions about how to accomplish that. Now, we haven't created the organization to do that. Um, I don't think it's a bureaucratic committee. I think it's a very thoughtful uh, one based on data and science and evidence uh, and people. Uh, and some of the science is what you're doing, Tom, and, to, and, and many of us do, in terms of how to actually take the breakthroughs in science and make them matter for, for everybody. But, you know, I, I just want to say that it's, the, it's our collective investment, starting with the National Institutes of Health, I see Francis Collins here, um, that on which everybody in this panel is building from, because it's those collective investments in uh, the diabetes prevention program, in the basic science of what frailty is, in what the genetics and biology of cancer are, that we have collectively invested in, that we now have all of these different opportunities to use. And, and if we, so, so I think along with amping up our ability to use all of these disruptive approaches, which is fabulous, it's a moment to amp up the, the transformations in the science for prevention and for care um, to, to, go, to support where we need to go. Tom? Yeah, I would close where we started, which is just um, really accelerated investments in scaling evidence-based prevention programs. I mean, that's, uh, that's what I'm most excited about. Two, two dimensions. Linda said it. You heard about disruption in all of its positive forms today, but also competition. This idea that we're competing for best outcomes, we're competing for how patients should be cared for, there is an enormous amount of energy and benefit that comes from free market competition. Uh, I, we didn't have time to talk about that, Dave, but a lot of what's going on in disruption is because of incentives that work to create in the free market the best outcomes for patients. The partnership that's working now is disruptive. We have to get there through a slightly revised regulatory framework. But there's never been in human history a better time to think about being in the biomedical research area. And Linda said it perfectly. If you think about life expectancy in the last 10 to 15 years, just in that window, in the United States, life expectancy has gone up one year in 10. This is all because of what is represented by this table and you know, thousands of other companies that are trying to disrupt on the back of the best technology, the best uh, data sets, and because we have a regulatory framework that has the right incentives. Well, thank you all so much for thank being you. here today and for the work you do all, every day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye.